Welcome to Mind Pump. In this episode, we're going to talk about why having a victim mentality is a surefire way to fail at fitness and probably everything else in your life. He fell in love with me and I fell in love with him and now my feelings have changed. You got to stop blaming everyone and everything else. I think I feel bad that I invited all these people to this huge wedding. It, it, bottom line, it, do some people have it easier than others? Yeah. That's a fact of life, man. That's just the way it works. Also, we talk about what happens if you eat highly processed foods for 30 days straight. It's not pretty. I'm, I'm looking for the ugly stepsister. Ah. In the second half of the episode, we answer four questions from our Instagram account at Mind Pump Media. Questions like, what is my muscle building potential and how can I figure that out? And what should I do if my friends and family demonize me because I try to make really healthy choices and they think I should be eating crap? Finally, if you're looking for a way to share clips with other people that are short and concise, or if you want to search specific topics, go to our other YouTube channel, Mind Pump Clips, and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. For long-term fitness success, you must eliminate the victim mentality. If you want to do well, you have to embrace responsibility and you have to feel empowered, not disempowered. Ooh, I know. personal accountability. That's, That's it. hard. You know, it's- What's uh, driving this message today? Oh, I tell you, it's the politici- pol it's the how politics is now getting into fitness and nutrition. That's the issue. And I see this body acceptance movement continue to become distorted and twisted and grow. And ba what they're doing is they're taking. Obviously, there was a there was a one side that was wrong of how fitness and health were promoted. Right? It was about being ripped and being extreme. And then they went in the other direction, saying things like "This is healthy" when obviously it's an obese individual, and this means I love my body when obviously they're they're, they're displaying that they don't love themselves in the truest sense. And what that promotes is it promotes this victim mentality where. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm obese, but it's my genetics, or I'm obese, and it's because I grew up in this particular neighborhood, or because of uh, you know the food that I didn't have access to, or because of whatever that I don't have control. I don't have. I'm not empowered, which is the it's it's anti long term success in health and fitness because the only way to really make it work long term is to accept full responsibility and move forward. Also, accept the, the limitations. Fine, I don't have the genetics that are going to let me be. A professional athlete, or I don't have the genetics that are make me. It's going to make it where I can walk around shredded with a six pack all the time. That's fine. I accept that. I'm going to move forward anyway. So I heard a I heard a, a neat analogy. I think it was I think Jen Cohen was interviewing somebody. I wish I remember who it was, uh, but it was a, it was a small clip, and it was talking about this, and he was talking about um, that we're all dealt. Uh, different cards, but it's not about the cards that you're dealt, but it's about how you play the hand. Always. And he gives like the poker analogy of like, I've seen somebody with, you know, pocket twos mm -hmm. win a million dollars in poker because the way they played their hand. And I've seen people with, you know, a right. full house and lose all this money because of how they played their hand. So you could come from this super privileged situation, but also become a drug addict, a loser and do and fuck all the, all those great cards up. The same that you could come from absolutely nothing and not have anything or not have a favorable hand and actually be someone who turns out to be a superstar. Yep. So it's less about what you're dealt and it's more about how you yeah, deal with it. And the way cards. I look at it is I look at it like this, like forget, you know, being the best in the world or being the worst <laughs> in the world. Everybody has a potential and it's a wide range. Like think about it this way. How far down and dark do you think you could get if you made just terrible, bad decisions your entire life? Like that potential is massive, right? Well, there's an equally high potential for how how well you could do if you make good decisions, if you took responsibility, if you worked hard, if you were honest and you did the right things. So that's your potential. Accepting that you can't change th certain things is part of working towards that. And then accepting your responsibility and saying, I'm going to focus on what I can do. And look, we've all had those clients that you could tell that they were going to be successful because they had this attitude, or you could tell they weren't going to be successful. Like if, when I had a client that was all about excuses, all about, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, the, just feeling like a victim and poor me and poor me. Like if I couldn't get them to change that mentality, I knew it was going to fail. It was just, they weren't going to, they weren't going to be able to do this. They weren't going to be able to improve their health in any meaningful way, or at least not for long term. Well, one message is empowering and moves you in positive behavioral changes. And one message, you know, really just 
is negative. It takes you, um, it, it provides you with with answers and and keeps you in in a place where you know you're already um, you know not doing too well. It's it's it does nothing in terms of um, create any kind of opportunity other than to just basically profess this is where I am. Yep. Do you guys do you guys uh, recall a, a period of time in your life when you f- feel like you felt that way about yourself or did you, have you always been about personal responsibility and or, do you, was there ever a transition or do you think you were, cause sometimes I feel like it's a, yeah, some people, I feel like some people, yeah, have it like early on, you know? Well, I, I feel like it's, it, I, I think it's more common the younger you are. It's, yeah. it's almost an, an immature way of thinking that I'm like this, this victimhood, like I'm a, I'm a helpless kid, you know? Yeah. And then as you get older and you, and you, you trek through life a little bit, you start to gain a little bit more personal responsibility. Not always. Some mm. <laughs> keep going all the way till they're much older and they still feel this way. So, do you remember a, a period in your in your life where you kind of felt like a victim and then you've transitioned out of that, or did you never feel that? God, way? that's tough because mm. it, it was so probably not you, Justin. You're too white, so I don't. <laughs> think <it> was, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You and Doug, uh, I could too, never glom on. This, to... this question's more for Sal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sal having yeah. immigrant parents. You know what? Having Everybody dark complexion. Me did you ever remember it. a time feeling sorry for yourself? Yeah. Um. <laughs> you know, I I didn't, but it was really never. It was modeled so strongly. My parents didn't talk. By the way, it's not like they sat me down and said. <clears throat> take responsibility. You know, you have to be empowered. You're not a victim. Nobody ever sat me down and said that to me. They were just, they modeled it so much. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, my, my parents came here. They were very poor, uneducated. My father, I think he went to fourth grade and that was it. Cause he was super poor and he never, he didn't sit there and complain about the fact that he couldn't speak the language that he didn't know how to write uh, and read in English that Jobs were hard for him to find. All I saw him do was was go out and do it. And then when there were challenges, right. he always would be like, "What can I do?" How, you know. And my mom was the same way. And so I feel like it was just so it was already, it was modeled. It was, modeled, it was instilled yeah. in you. Yeah, at, at a young, without yeah. like they didn't say it. You know what I mean? Because I saw it yeah. that way. Which I think why I grabbed onto fitness so much because it was this very well, like it, it fit that. Like, I was teasing you, Justin, but did you ever? I mean, well, because I mean, so I've noticed this too in the sports realm a lot like in in being around a lot of different coaches and so the message was never like you know that they were never providing you with with excuses and answers for your failures and like to um you know to to you know project that out and blame everything else like even even too like uh, you know and because you're on sports teams you're you're around a lot of different personalities you're around a lot of different um you know people from different backgrounds yeah. social and economic backgrounds like you know i was always immersed with like a very diverse group of people growing up and and you know even then going to chicago and like so you know it's it, and that message just never resonated that victim message and it's just interesting to me um, you know, now where culture has shifted so much of like, we're, there's no, none of these like, uh, underdog stories are being highlighted anymore in terms of like overcoming, you know, adversity, overcoming the odds. It's, yeah. it's just this, it's, it's this sort of, um, fodder that's just thrown out there to, uh, sort of, um, you know, justify like it anger and outrage, uh, against like a lot of the, um, the success know, of other people, the success of other people. Yeah. Yeah. So right. that's, it's just interesting to me. I, yeah. I, I, I don't, I can't really say that I've, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've definitely had like victim mentality for certain things, but I think it just was so modeled away from that. You know what I love about, uh, sports. The one thing that I love about sports is it's a, it's a, in in many ways, it's oh, an it example. Personal responsibility at the, on the highest level. Well, it's sure. it's an example. It's a it's a nice represent re- representation of life, yeah. uh, right? And and so you can say whatever you want. You can have whatever philosophy you want, but if the team wins, they win. And the players that play the best tend to make the most money, and they tend to lead how other people should play. And then the teams that work together tend to do the best. Not only that, but if you've played sports long enough, you've seen this example happen before where the the gifted, talented, more privileged athlete is the starter and he's awesome and he's amazing. But then there, there's always that one guy on the team who isn't as gifted and talented, but then outworks we're him. outworks him yeah. and then takes that. If you've played and sports- we celebrated it. That's right. If you play sports long enough, you've seen, you've seen that happen. And I think to your point of like, it's a great representation of life because- 
that does happen. It absolutely happens. There's absolutely people that are in a much more privileged situation and that are gifted and talented and don't have to put the work in as hard as the other people. And they naturally kind of rise to the top. But then there's always that guy who, who didn't have all that and ends up outworking yep. that guy. And then it takes that, takes that position. You know why in, in most many sports, it remains somewhat pure in that sense is because you watch their evolution and you watch the game. So you see what's happening. You You're, see, you see the hard work, you see the, play like you don't see people arguing why lebron james gets paid so much versus another player because you're like well obviously i can watch what he's doing right i see what's happening you know with it's funny okay with strength sports you get more and by the way by no means is there a huge victim mentality in in the sport i'm about to mention but you see more victim mentality in bodybuilding than you do in strength sports like olympic lifting and powerlifting why subjective yes yeah you, you'll hear bodybuilders complain and whine more because it's judged whereas in powerlifting the guy lifted more than you did like what are you gonna say yeah you know there's nothing you could say about it and in sports you see that so this is why you'll see people who will say wow ceos get paid too much but professional athletes and entertainers don't like you never hear someone say beyonce makes way too much you see how much she gets she pays her staff versus how much she makes you don't see that so much because people watch her perform. They see how talented they, she is. But this nameless, faceless CEO, nobody sees what they do behind the scenes, how hard they work and how much value they bring yeah. to the company. All they see is how much money they make and how much the people who work for them make. And then they make these arguments. And and that's it started, they're trying to pour that into health and fitness. Now, you might want to ask why. Why do they want to pour that into health and fitness? Because it can sell you shit. You know how easy it is to sell somebody something when I tell you it's not your fault, yeah. it's everybody else's fault? Because I have the answer. I have the answer. Yeah, yeah. Here's the pill. Here's the thing. <clears throat> Here's, oh, I know taking responsibility is really hard. Like when I had to sit down and and examine my, my first marriage and some of the con contributions I made to my divorce, that was hard. I had to sit there and be like, oh, yeah. I played some roles in, in, in all of that. That's hard to do. Right. It would have been, it would in the moment, it would have felt good if somebody came to me and said, you did nothing wrong, Sal. It yeah. was all the other person's fault, right? And then I'm like, okay, good. I don't have to bear that burden. But then there would be no change. There would be no me moving yeah. forward. I wouldn't have become a better person. And that's the thing. So if you want long-term success in, in your own health and fitness, you got to stop blaming everyone and everything else. It, it, bottom line, it, do some people have it easier than others? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a fact of life, man. That's just the way it works. Now what? What are you going to do now? You got to accept what you got and you got to move forward anyway. You got to accept your genetics and move forward anyway. You got to accept the fact that you can change your nutrition with whatever tools you have, money, no money, whatever. You got to accept the fact that you can be more active or less active regardless of the equipment and the gyms you have access to. You got to accept those things and move forward. And when you do that, you will accomplish long-term success. If you don't, you'll fail every single time. No one has ever succeeded long-term with that victim mentality in health and fitness. Today's free workout giveaway is MAPS Split. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you got free access to MAPS Split. Also, we got a big sale going on this month on two very popular workout programs, MAPS Symmetry, one of our most popular programs, one of our newer programs that helps build symmetry between the right and left side of the body. That program is 50% off. And then MAPS Strong, that's a strongman-inspired workout program, is also 50% off. So both programs, 50% off. You can find both of them if you click on the link at the top of the description below to get the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. Andrew, did you ever go through that? Did you go through feeling like a victim at any point in your life? Yeah. From what age to what age? And when did you snap out of it? Um, <clears throat> it's okay, though. High school. And then coming out of high school. Yeah. It yeah. took me until my early 20s until I felt like I snapped out of it. Was this yeah. when, you, when you got you, your, your girlfriend pregnant, if you don't mind me saying? Was that yeah, that? Yeah, my yeah. girlfriend pregnant. Um, things with my parents, things like yeah. that, more specifically my father um, being absent in my life. Yeah. And Blaming him, um, and then it took a while before I, I was able to recognize that, be aware of it, and then take things like in my own control. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you did take those things into control, it was probably a big difference. Yeah, well, it brought back like a lot of confidence in yeah. everything that I did, and fitness, I think, helped kind of bring me in that direction. Yeah, so I'd say the same time period for myself. It was probably, you know, what's funny is I actually didn't think I, I was. What the, my attitude or the way I thought, um, because yeah, many in many ways you were also 
like I'll, I'll pull myself up by my bootstraps at a young right. age. Right, and so and I did have that attitude, but then I there there was there was still a um, this undertone of victimhood too, because mm. and what I would do is I would compare myself to my peers that were complaining about oh. us now, and I'd be like, come on. Like you're that, that's what you're complaining about. I, and in my head, I'm going, I've been through so much worse. I've been through so much oh, worse. Like a chip. Yeah. So I, and I, and, and I didn't real, mm. I didn't realize it. I wasn't truly at that point in my life. Um, I, maybe I didn't think I was, I had victimhood, but I didn't, uh, where I'm at now, I'm actually grateful of the disadvantages I had, you know, chew on that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Like I'm so grateful for all those things. And that didn't take until my mid, mid to late twenties, of actually going back and taking account of all the shitty things that have happened in my life, whether I brought them on my own or I was, I inherited them or I had no control of them didn't matter. What I realized was all the ones that I went through and overcame, I started to connect the dots to what that created mm -hmm. in my life or the character that it built mm -hmm. or the success that I had afterwards or the, I mean, and then what I started to see was like, whoa, the stuff that I think was like poor me or the shittiest part, the the ability for me to work through that and overcome it, what I got from that was was some of the most valuable things that I ever got in my life, and so then it, it started. So then I started to reframe, you know, these disadvantages uh, that either I had or that would happen to me in life. Because I quickly realized like, oh, this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for growth. If I can make, this is shitty, this is unfair, this sucks, but man, it's a test. If I can make it through this and I surpass this or I overcome this disadvantage, then now I'm at an advantage because this other kid who was more privileged and didn't have to overcome that, he didn't build the skills that I had to build to overcome that. And I just... I think that was like this major pivotal moment in my life was to start to look at those things. So, and then now, and it doesn't mean that I think I'm invincible or I, I don't have situations where I get down or frustrated and I have a moment of going like, fuck, that sucks. Why'd that happen to me? And, but quickly it, it shifts to, oh, here's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, something, and, and, you and something great's going to come. Something from you said right there was really important is you said, yeah, it sucked. Yeah, it was hard. Yeah, it was unfair. It's important you say that because what what people will do, the people who promote the victim mentality, what they'll glob onto is, well, you don't know how hard it is. Right, that you don't have empathy for you don't people. know. Yes, yeah. and that's okay. That's not at all what I'm. Look, look, I've made a career. We all made a career out of helping people through the struggle of obesity, through the struggle of poor health, through changing relationships to food, and all the reasons why the relationships to food were not ideal, or all the reasons why they weren't active and why they had poor relationships with exercise in their bodies. Like we made careers out of that and we were successful because we were empathetic, mm -hmm. but we were also successful because we understood that I don't care who I had in front of me and I don't care how great of it. I consider myself a pretty damn good trainer and I got pretty good at the end there, but I, I can't do anything unless the person accepts that responsibility. There's, it wouldn't, I couldn't do anything. I can't do it for you is the bottom line. And so that's the truth. So the yeah. empathy is there. But you know, it's funny, real empathy is uh, like, man, that sucks, but also you can do this. Yeah. And right. there's, and that's what, the only- What can you do to improve things? That's the only way that's, it's going to happen yeah, right, right. is if, if you do this. And right. so that's why I want to talk about that because um, if you feel so, if you're sitting there feeling sorry for yourself yeah. and you're not moving forward as a result of it and you're, and you're pointing the finger at everybody else- you're going to be stuck and you're going to be dark. It's well, never going to change. It's funny. I feel like I gave a terrible answer to you for that, but it's like, it, to me, I, looking back, it's it's really, I always thought everything was my fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, ever since I was a kid, uh, being the youngest and, and just having that kind of communicated to me from coaches or parents or, you know, just like not living up to expectations and standards and, and things. And so I had a huge chip on my shoulder. And so I just, I never really took that roll on in terms of like blaming other people mm. quite as much but it was like it getting out of that and like the guilt of that and like taking everybody's shit on you know in terms of like how they viewed me versus how i view myself and not having like you know that kind of well i had to build up my own self-confidence well that's a, that's an interesting point because this is a product of potential being in a privileged situation because you feel like man i i, I have these other people that had way less than me and they sort of figured it out and i haven't figured it out yet i'm, yeah. I'm a loser i haven't I'm, I'm this i'm that that's that voice that you're now starting to or that that conversation 
you're having with yourself because you you came from a situation that may be more privileged well, than other you people. You don't want to say you're a loser because that's also being a victim. It's more like, I'm going to figure this out. Yeah. You know, there's two types of people, right? There's the person that looks at the success, the success of someone else and says, how, how dare that person have that success? Who did they steal from? How did they cheat the system? They don't deserve that. I deserve some of that. Then there's the other person that looks at success and goes, wow, that's awesome. Look at what's what look at what what potential there possibly is. Maybe I can get to that place. Or there's maybe a, I can get close a, to that there's place. There's a spectrum of that, right? I feel like. Because i I mean, even even us off air when we're when we're evaluating somebody we don't know anything about, I'm always intrigued by somebody who's had success. Of course. I always. Like I'm I I don't I I'm I I reserve judgment no matter how much I disagree with what they say or I don't like the way they do stuff. I'm interested. If you found a way to have success, um, I, I, I re- I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious to what, what worked in your life. And mm-hmm. not a lot of people are like that. A lot of people see that and instantly want to look for the holes in those people and the things that are negative and bad. And I just have a, 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 a you do, deal. you do do that very well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. For sure. You know, uh, this is, a uh, maybe connected to it, but what's interesting is I'm starting to see that there seems to be a, in, an interest or more of a groundswell in kind of what I'm talking about or what we're talking about, Re- rejecting the victim mentality, accepting responsibility, um, and the things that you have control over. There seems to be something stirring in people and growing. And I do think it may be the result of the insanity over the last couple of years. I really do. Because I think now looking back, now that we're kind of somewhat separated from the last, you know, just the unprecedented last couple of years, I think a lot of people are looking back and going, um, that was a little crazy. And I think you guys gaslit us a bit. And I think we overacted, overreacted. And hmm. you know what? I felt coerced. I could tell I was manipulated by fear. We did a lot of things that were stupid. Um, I don't think I want to give anybody that power anymore. And I'm starting to sense Mm -hmm. it with people. People are starting to talk more about it. So speaking of like, you know, uh, being grateful for certain things, uh, I think I'm grateful for the insanity of the last couple of years because I'm starting to see people are starting to say this kind of stuff. Looking yeah. back and going, why the hell did it's we do something? Very transparent shit? now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it came all out uh, because of yeah, just everybody's fear and hysteria. It's like you could see what uh, the result was. Dude, I I read an article. Decisions. I read an article that enraged. So my wife, first of all, if people think I'm outspoken, you have no idea. My wife is. <laughs> I, I joke with these guys all the time. If I ever ended up in the gulags, it was probably because my wife saying something. Like she's way worse than I am. And I shared an article and with her and, and some of my aunts, and they were just so pissed off because you guys remember when they when they were like pushing everybody to get vaccinated, right? Yep. And there were women that were coming out saying, "This is messing with my menstrual cycle. My period is off. It's heavier. It's pausing." And people who were saying this on sh- social media were getting shut down and blocked. Mm-hmm. And y- you can't say that. Don't say that. Well, now there's studies coming out saying, "Oh yeah, it definitely it, it may in fact have an effect on women's menstrual cycles." Th- I mean, the, the women in my family were so angry. Because it's like they gaslit the shit out of people. And that's just one example. Mm -hmm. So I think stuff like that is making people look back and go, hmm, maybe we shouldn't give people that kind of control. How how trustworthy are a lot of these officials in these powerful positions? Well, speaking of gaslighting, and and I guess guess you have to, I feel like you have to laugh about this because it's, it's, I can't be the person who's just going to constantly be negative about this stuff. So I have to find things like this that I just kind of like chuckle because it's like, you know, this is what happens when you gaslight and you do such stupid stuff. Did you see the vice? uh, Oh yeah. Did you see (laughs) that they brought, you guys told me about this. So, okay. Vice, vice, which is unfortunate because I I used to like vice and I just feel like, especially in the last couple of years, they seem like they have an agenda. Yeah. And they've gone super, super woke direction. So at that, I still consume the content though. I'm like, I'm, I'm I'm always like that where I like to still consume it from both sides all the time. I I actually follow some of the most wokest pages. Yeah, I do. I do too. I want to hear. I do too. I think it's important. I think it's important Mm -hmm. for, for balance. So I do. Uh, and up pops this thing where they were doing, I guess, vice did this whole like documentary on the, the this, you know, pedophile getting out of jail. And then or, or you know, was he or, or he sex was a, offender? He, sex was a, offender. he was a sex yeah. offender. Sorry. So he's a, a sex offender. That's like was integrate it? them into society. They need. Yeah. More and they, and they, they have that. More. They have like the, you know, the, 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 the soft music playing and like, I'm just going to yeah, change my poor life. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. Like and he's, yeah, yeah. playing all that. Like he's, you know, going to get back into society, change his life and like a comeback story mm. and not, but 20 minutes later after he he leaves a studio, he sends a dick pic to the fucking producer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
After this interview, Ashif sent a picture of his penis to our producer. Boy, that wow, backfired. That didn't huh? take long, oh, dude. Jeez. Wow. Do you know? Do you know what the? You know? You know what's sad? You know what the statistic is on them doing it again? This guy, I would oh, imagine it's probably it's really astronomical. Seventy percent, yeah. dude. I mean, that, now, now, now that still that means thirty percent don't. Right. That's right. That's still well. right. So you can't. Yeah, and so so we can't castrate them all just because no. seventy percent of them yeah. still don't. You know get, what my view is on that? My view is the crimes that should be punished the most harsh are crimes uh, against people, meaning uh, violence, sexual assault, mm -hmm. um, property crimes. I think should be pu punished relatively harshly. The crimes that I think shouldn't be punished nearly as harshly as, you, as they get punished are like crimes against yourself. Like right. I'm, I'm using You're drugs. Doing drugs or, against yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, that doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to me uh -uh. that getting caught with a bunch of cocaine will get you thrown in jail for longer than than you sexually abusing a child or right. sexually assaulting a woman or punching someone on the You're street. Destroying other people's lives. Yeah, or, or or smashing a business's windows and stealing their shit. That kind of stuff should be punished the most harsh. Yeah. The stuff you do to yourself, that's you're hurting yourself. And I know there's other ramifications, but I think it makes more sense that those are punished less harshly. Crimes against property and people should be punished the most harsh. You know, I, I wonder how many, you know, uh, I Think, I'm thinking about the number I just gave you, the 70% of those sex offenders. I wonder of the 30%, what percent of those were situations where like, you know, a 19-year-old guy slept with his 17-year-old girlfriend. Like, they, Obviously, they probably fall on that mm. that 30%. So what of that 30% that are reformed, quote unquote, then are actually just people that had that were that part of the situation. And how many of them that were actually yeah. true, like true, true sex? Or like, like you, or peed, they pee, they you got in, caught peeing outside yeah, they of were, school. Yeah, you were drunk at, you know, two in the morning and you, yeah. you got out of your, you know, you, your buddy pulled over and you pissed in his school and then you got nailed for it. Like, yeah, yeah. Those are, if, you wore a if you wore a fake dick and taught a class, I'm sure it'd be okay. <laughs> wow. Did you find I'm out sorry, a, dude, Did you find out if that was trolling yet or not? I still that guy with the, 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 I think it I think it me like, yeah, it was like some Reddit article, like, you know, and it, I mean, I would have hoped that that was the case, like, but yeah, I don't know if for sure if that's that's. It true smells or not. like a massive troll to me. It, you know why? Because it would have so crazy, but yes, yeah. yes. it looks so crazy. But you, but you know, you never know. <laughs> you just never, never know these days. Did, so you, you haven't. Fa so Reddit was trying to say that it was. They were trying to basically say that um, he he had problems with some of the policies of the school. Uh, before and so this was like uh, his his way of being his like, way of being like well if we're going all well can go in this direction like he literally like dressed make with it the extreme. prosthetics and you know it has to be I, I mean because it's so I'm so it's so extreme it does sort of make sense right are you not convinced that way I'm no, so convinced that way no I'm not I'm not because uh, from what I read he had he's they already knew that he was going through he was transitioning and so that was just part of so it wasn't like it happened overnight it was something that that they were doing. And then they came to school. Yeah, but he massive. could be he could be uh, he could be transgender and potentially transitioning and still have, have issues with the school over like stupid stuff. And they're and so he he went, oh okay, yeah. You won't you won't let me do. You won't mess with me. I'll mess with you. Yeah, right. So maybe could, yeah. So he could still. So both the, those stories. What could a be weird true. what a weird world right now. I know. <laughs> you know, I don't explain it. You know, it is a, though. But that's one of the a to, me, to me things like that are one of the best ways. To put a mirror in our face, you know what bit, I think to let us know, like how, like wow, that I guess we hadn't thought it that far out that it could get there, and how ridiculous or, it is or, now that we're here. Or you know? fine, let's just be let's just be clear and draw a line. Like here's, I think it's the ultimate. You want to talk about patriarchy and sexism? That to me is one of the most the, the most egregious examples. Had a woman, a biological mm -hmm. woman, who naturally had those kinds of massive boobs, who wore a sheer because. This person's also wearing a sheer thin shirt where you can literally see the outline and color of the nipples yeah, and they're poking no out. No bra. Had a yes, had a woman who was built that way come to class and done that, they would have got sent home. They would have got sent home for being inappropriate. But because this person says that they're transgender, yeah. they can't touch them. That's to me. That's that seems like that smells a lot like sexism. And if I was a woman, I'd be like, excuse me. That's not cool because yeah. if anybody, if any of us did that, you guys would have sent us home and said it was inappropriate. Yeah, right. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, I got to bring up this this crazy. There was this UK doctor. I'm going to bring it up, who did this um, this ultra processed diet for 30 days. Have you guys oh, read about this? Oh, no, no, I didn't read about it. I did hear about it though. Yes. So they went on a ultra processed diet for a, just a month. 80 percent of of their diet was ultra processed food for 30 days. And what they found was uh, now are, okay. So, uh, 
are they restricted calories? Are they, I mean, are they actually dieting or are they just eating? They're just eating. Okay, so there's this is not a diet then. This no, is, no, this they is just, just what they're saying is they're they're going to eat all processed food. Eighty percent of their diet would be ultra processed, and they would just eat that way and see what happened. So listen to their body, eat as much as they want, as little as they want, basically, and see what would happen, right? Because I think it's um, disingenuous to put someone on an ultra processed diet, but then control their calories. Because uh -huh. a big part of of the problem with these foods is they make you overeat and all sure, that stuff, right? Sure. So this this what this guy did. So went on this diet and within, first off, within a few days, he noticed that he felt way more hungry, way more often than he used to. So he started craving more foods. He became extremely constipated. Check out some of the stuff that, this is in 30 days. Constipated? Yeah. His diet is obviously his digestion was messed up as a yeah. result. Within 30 days, he gained 14 pounds. Yeah. Which, in, okay. So 14 pounds, a lot of that was bloat and water and some of it was body fat. His, uh, his blood test revealed that there was a 30% increase in hunger hormones. Mm. So the hormones that drive hunger went through the roof. Stuff we've been saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I remember when so, I brought remember when I told you guys how like I mean the the process of of competing was one of the neatest things that I experienced as a trainer because uh it was the the best test i had ever done like on my with things like this and i rem i clearly remember how interesting it was to eliminate uh protein bars as part of my comp yeah. as part of my, of my prep and then have one where i said oh i have whatever i want and then you know vividly remember like wanting so like oh introducing it being like oh these taste different it's been a while since I've had one of these not liking it to then liking it then the loving it craving. and then wanting two and then eating three and then going like oh my god I had four of those today like so wild to to feel that and no, recognize well, that check, in myself you well know? check this out this is the most crazy part of this right they did brain scans before and after so you could actually see what was happening in the brain. Doctors revealed that the new diet had sparked, this is in 30 days, had sparked the creation of new functional connections between certain brain regions. So the quote is, the diet has linked up the reward centers of my brain with the areas that drive repetitive, automatic behavior. So eating ultra processed food has become something my brain simply tells me to do without me even wanting it, which is what you see in people with addiction. Hmm. So literally his brain changed and it, it, it compelled him to want to eat more and more of these foods, even though he felt like, objectively, he said, I felt like garbage, mm -hmm. I had terrible digestion, my energy was crap. It was driving him to keep going. I mean, are we crazy? Are we surprised? Some of the no, probably the no. best, probably some of the best scientists in the world, I would assume, work for food companies. You're right. Yeah. Some Did of the, they test his the smartest scientists no. in the world are working for freaking food companies to, for that exact reason. So I'm not, I'm not surprised at, that at all. You know, Speaking of processed foods, this is a, a terrible commercial transition, but it's the truth, right? So, <laughs> I mean, I think it's. I also think it's important, though. With our, I mean, because uh, sometimes people uh, obviously hear us talk about processed foods and then assume that like that doesn't happen in my life. Like, one hundred percent processed foods get into uh, my diet. It's uh, it's it's not impossible to not like I could live off of a whole food diet, but the reality is that they're, it, they're convenient, and sometimes it's a, a choice we do. Here's an example. Uh, of how I've even let my son have processed foods right now. So we the the school he goes to doesn't have um, a microwave. And one of the things I've been telling Katrina is just like, you know, when I look at his lunch, it's very carb heavy. And I'm like, and it's not bad, okay, quote unquote, but he's, he's not getting a lot of protein mm. in his in his lunch and stuff like that. And she's like, well, they don't have a microwave, so I don't want to give him like Cold, cold meat bison or, yeah. and like because that's normal when he eats at home he eats what we eat you know mm -hmm. we have we have bison and sweet potato we just do a small version in his little cups and that's what he eats and he loves it but making the kid eat it cold and stuff like that i'm like nah. so she's she's giving him a lot of like package stuff and uh i was like why don't you do the beef sticks and she goes I, you know I didn't, i've never thought of that i'm like yeah just chop because she's always paranoid about him swallowing and choking on everything right so we have to chop everything she cuts everything up so i'm like yeah just cut them up in, in small pieces put them in a you little snack zip. on them yeah and snack i i would rather that than these you know air crisp wafer things that we get yeah. them that are you know it's just a bunch of carbs you know what i'm saying and they're, again they're not bad does it's he just, like them he loves them yeah he absolutely now loves they them. And now, now he's getting more protein now there mm -hmm. is processed and then there's there's a scale of processed right there's sure like there's ultra process, yeah right that. like 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 jerky in general is is it is a processed more processed form of meat than just having a steak, 
but there's a lot of types of jerkies and meat sticks that are minimally processed. Basically, the process to give them a long shelf life and make them convenient. And you can get some that are more or less, right? But these beef sticks are well, look at, minimal I, I, ingredients. So his, it, it, what right. it's replacing, so he he gets those, you know, organic um, squeezies all the time, right? That's like one of his favorite things yeah. with that. But they're so carb heavy. Yeah. You know, it's fruit, fruit and vegetables, which is great, great. It's not bad. But it's like, I know he's not getting a good balance of protein. And so, you know, I'm trading one processed food that he was going to do anyways yep. with another one that's grass-fed beef, beef jerky sticks, like, and he's not getting it. like to me. It's a no brainer. Dude, have you guys tried mm -hmm. their 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 chocolate flavored bone broth? I saw you post no. it. Okay, so they have new. So yeah, chocolate is that new? Broth? Yeah. So you know, I want to say this too because I get uh, people will message me and say I thought bone broth and collagen was an inferior protein in comparison to whey, which is okay. Whey protein, egg protein are superior compared to other forms of protein in a gram for gram basis. Now, if you eat enough protein, it doesn't matter. If your protein intake's high, you get enough amino acids anyway. However, I will say this. That you got to consider digestibility. So for me, 50 grams of whey protein versus 50 grams of uh, bone broth, the bone broth is superior because I can't digest whey. So I don't care how superior it is, it it, it messes up my gut. So I love bone broth proteins because mm -hmm. they for me, it's and I working with clients and and you know my family and friends, same for them. It's the easiest protein you'll ever have in terms of digestibility. It literally is like just water. Yeah. You feel nothing. Now, they only, Paleo Valley had unflavored bone broth, which I liked because I don't want anything in there. It's just literally bone broth. But a lot of people want it to taste a particular way. So Paleo Valley made one that was chocolate. It's actually, it's really so good. walk me through that. So do you eat it or drink it, I should say, um, like hot? Like, is it like something you, you put in water and you, no, you cold. sort of warm it up or you just drink it just cold? Just drink it cold. And it's like it's, a protein shake. Because really. like, okay. It, you know what so it tastes you, like? It I think tastes, about bone broth. I don't ugh. think chocolate is yeah, a good I don't match like with that. But like, how does that hit your hit your taste buds? No, it tastes just like, cho like a chocolate shake. Doug tried it. Yeah, too. I love it. It's like so, a, just a chocolate so shake. So I, I have yet to do this, but I am interested in doing it because I, I have, um, when I do the whey protein, there's a limited amount of how much I can do. Oh, until it messes with you. Yeah. yeah. So, like, if I go, if I go away and I mix it in milk, and let's say I go one and a half scoops instead of just one, which is the serving size, it'll, it'll, I'll have kind of bubble guts afterwards. And so I have to like stick to like I get one scoop away. But then there's times where I was like, man, I could really use double the scoop. It's not. Mm -hmm. I I know it won't sit well with me with the way. I'm curious if it would with the try it. Yeah, I it's the easy. Doug, do you digest it easily too? Yeah, no problem. It's really it's really it's like literally water. Like I could pound seventy grams of it, and I feel like I so that's nothing. what I'm curious about. I'm wondering if I could push the the grams of protein because it's the the bone broth. So yeah. I'll, I'll experiment with but that. But the chocolate flavor it tastes mm -hmm. like. Chocolate shake, especially if you mix it with uh, like macadamia nut milk or almond milk, it's like a chocolate shake. And it's actually, it's not like, you know, some protein powders like, yeah, it's chocolate, but uh, it still kind of doesn't. This actually tastes like a chocolate shake. It's actually really, it's, I would say it rivals chocolate whey protein shakes. Now, I saw you did like four scoops or something. I saw you post it. You did quite a few scoops. Uh, like five, I think. Yeah. Five. Yeah. So I'm putting like a little over 50 grams in there. Is that how much you got? Yeah. You know, and because that's for me, that would be like a serving. Right. And it's like, again, I, it's almost like I drank water. So I've been doing, I always did their unflavored, but I know people like, they're like, I don't want unflavored. Plus, by the way, the unflavored bone broth doesn't have that much of a flavor. It doesn't taste like chicken soup or something like that. Yeah. It's got almost, it's got a very um, mild kind of bland it's almost flavor. It's not flavorless, but it doesn't have a lot of flavor. Uh -huh. But the chocolate one tastes legit like chocolate. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one that imagines that's, you know, how it's going to taste. It's like, <laughs> yeah. a, like a chicken soup, you know, sort of broth. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's like all I think about. Like I mean, I'm chocolate like, chicken, chicken soup. soup with I was like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, wild. Yeah. But How like, many grams of pro did, did you do a big serving? or? So I did like uh, two scoops. I think there's 13 grams yeah. per scoop. And uh, I just mixed it with macadamia milk. Yeah, and it was great, like chocolate milk. Yeah. yeah, the only way it makes sense for me is if I can do four or five scoops and it not make me feel that way. Because yeah, absolutely, way will do that. There's been many a times when I'm getting a protein shake, which is how I use my protein shakes typically. Is I didn't get enough protein for the day. I know I didn't because I recall like the two yeah. meals I had. I'm like I'm at 90 grams. It's towards the end of the night. And I'm like I definitely need to get a protein shake. Now, in the past, what I would I, I've tried to do is, oh, I'll, I'll just I'll do three scoops of the whey protein, then, and I'll get like seventy grams of protein, hmm. and it I, it'll tear me up. And then you just yeah, you're I can have one. I can have one. Yeah, I can have one one scoop. Fine, totally sits uh, sits fine with me. 
But if I if I push the way too much, or again, if I mix it with with dairy. So I got a hack for everybody here. So I've never talked about, I can't believe I've never talked about this on the show. If you want to make, so protein is, it, it's satiety producing, right? So it helps with appetite. Protein powders, I would say, is a little lower on the scale because it's so pre-digested and so, you know, quick absorbing. But I have a way of making it produce even more satiety and making it even much healthier. So here's what you do. And you don't taste it. This is the crazy part. So you buy psyllium husk powder, not the, not the little granules, but when they, it's, it's literally like a fine powder. So you could buy psyllium husk in powder form and psyllium husk is just, it's just fiber. It's a lot of it is the, this undigestible fiber. People will take it for digestion to help them poop better, all that stuff. And I take psyllium husk probably two, three times a day just to add healthy fiber to my is it, diet. Is it considered like a digestive enzyme or what is it? What is no, it? No, it's, it's not it's a just, digestive just, enzyme. Just the fiber in it is what's... Yeah, yeah. So there's some, some types of fibers that feed your microbiome. This one kind of does a little bit, but really what it does is it helps things move through the body. So if you, if you take psyllium husk, you'll find you'll just have better bowel movements, better digestion. You tend to get lower cholesterol as a result. So people will take sometimes psyllium husk for that. So it's a very safe, healthy type of fiber. And you, they sell it in powder form. So what I do is I make my protein shake with, I'll use the bone broth, and then I'll put in like like a, like a kind of a level uh, tablespoon of the psyllium powder, shake it mm. up. You don't taste it. And I literally just added like seven, eight grams of fiber to my protein shake. Lube for your intestines. And, right? it, and it digests better and I get more of a satiety effect. So I'll do it and I'll feel a little bit fuller That's interesting. for longer. And you don't taste it. That's the crazy thing. You don't taste it in the powder. Don't Actually, most the powders it. have a decent amount of fiber already in them, though? No. Protein powders? Yeah, they no, are. there's zero fiber. Is there zero? Zero. It's just protein powder. Oh, no way. I didn't yeah. know that. No. Oh, I assume they infuse some of it with fiber already. They no, don't. nothing. Zero. Now, is that only when you're talking about like a, a pure source of like, if you do like a meal replacement shake? Will I mean, I don't know if they add fiber. I think sometimes they try to. But um, I don't, I, I mean, psyllium husk is super easy. It's not a fiber that, sometimes too much fiber can cause bloating. But most of the psyllium husk is the kind of fiber that passes through the body. So you're not absorbing it and breaking it down. It just goes through. Now, how, now how valuable do you think that is if I'm making my protein shake and I do like a peanut butter banana inside there? Already? I still think it's great. You still think Yeah, because you just added fiber to your diet. Yeah. And it makes it... Have you tried that yet? I have. In I your haven't done shake? it in a shake, no. But I use psyllium husk. And yeah, it works great. It you're, does. You're a big husky guy, huh? I'm big into yeah. husk, yeah. yeah <laughs> so <laughs> if you've ever mixed husks. the psyllium husk powder with water you'll see it kind of almost becomes like a gel if you leave it it'll yeah, gel up yeah. gel up a bit but that's what's happening in your your gut right yeah and it's kind of allowing things to uh, move more freely it, freely and, it, and it's a bulking agent does it so, give do you guys like the texture that it gives the uh the shake because i, that's, just I actually it, like have you ever done like i'll do like egg whites in my shake because i actually like that a one boosts my the, that's by the yeah, way builds up the body that's one of the ways bit. that i would do it in the past because it wouldn't upset my stomach to bump, oh. you know put a couple egg whites or back in the days when i had used to have the, oh the pump yeah yeah, yeah i just yeah. I'd pump a couple extra in inside the shake no it actually if anything it makes it a little thicker that mm -hmm. makes it a little creamier and thicker. We used to do that some drinks at the bar too. You put a little bit of egg and egg white in there. Oh, really? It. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's when they have the white builds body uh, to the drink, makes it a little thicker. Yeah, and delicious. That's a cool. I think that's yeah. always been a. Even if you just do a little, like you said, you don't have to do a ton. It just kind of makes it give this kind of it's like a frothiness mm -hmm. to it, and like mm -hmm. some yeah. Oh, so speaking of like processed food and whatnot, you brought up uh, to me before the show like that McDonald's yes. was coming back with Happy Meals, but for adults, for different. Yeah, for yes. adults. That's true. Yeah, yeah, kind of brilliant, right? Because I believe it was so the, smart. It was the eighties. Yeah. It was the eighties when the McDonald's toys thing became a thing, right? Yep. I believe. Sure, yep. it made right. a big impact on us growing up, right? For sure. And I, it's less popular now with kids. Not that the kids don't love it still, but it's not something like not like that was a big deal when we were. Kids. I bet. This so is what are the toys, up. dude? I, immediately, that's what I want to know. Oh, it's the right. characters. It's like Grimace. <laughs> it's the burglar, the hamburglar. It's I don't know what other. Yeah, but characters. do we get adult toys? No, I, yeah. So <laughs> I would. I actually think they're gonna go that route i think you might adult see, toys well no, no 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 i think they'll revisit like okay uh Garfield super happy or, meal yeah. or characters that were meal. popular when because obviously you know that happy meals weren't just the characters from mcdonald's right you know that right? oh i know that okay yeah. yeah so so like you know a hot wheels collector car like, i mean I, I could see it like doing things that vibrating go, grimace following the same trend it did when we what does it say Doug? by the does way it say what grimace does look a little bit like a butt plug let's right? be honest that's I mean, why he's, he's, grimace he's set up for that he's, he's very yeah, it has a cool odd looking figurine inside and i think it's one of these characters from mcdonald's it's well, actually not called a happy meal it's called a cactus plant flea market box 
Why would they call it something what? weird? What well, the because, hell? <laughs> well, because Happy Meals attached to children. Uh, so it's, it's based on the fashion brand collaborating with McDonald's. On this oh, who's the, who's the brand? I guess Cactus Plant Flea Market. I don't oh, know. It's, uh, I have to double check it. Yeah, that makes that even more interesting. It's name. called Cactus Plant Flea Market. You can check them out. It's, it's weird. Are you actually. pulling them up, Andrew? I'm, I didn't even know. That's I'm, what, I'm so out of the loop. I know. You know what I, mean? I just remember, so Jack in the Box was one of the first um, sort of fast food companies that started to Is that Dr- target Travis Scott's stoners. Brand? You know, I have smart. No idea. I was figuring this was going to be another one of those sort of late night try to like get the the stoner the stoner box the happy meal yeah stoner that, box that would crush right so that's the brand okay well so, look I think this is going to crush because I think there's enough nostalgia in our age group of yeah. people who are like I haven't eaten in McDonald's in a long time are you guys are you guys familiar I mean, this is this has been popular in streetwear for a, a long time but that's you see it more and more. You saw it Super Bowl commercials a uh, few back where you start to see like, uh, I believe it was like Mountain Dew and like Lay's Chips did a commercial oh, together. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, really smart marketing and you see it happening more and more. Are you, are you familiar with that too, Doug? Like, have you seen that with brands where they- Doug's all into streetwear. No, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't seen it. <laughs> it's just a really brilliant strategy to take two brands that actually- have no real synergy as far as uh you know the same space right like you're talking about a apparel brand and mcdonald's like there's no conflict of interest of like, like and they they can only help each other when you think about it oh, so I by see. co-branding or by doing so, a collaboration together like this is is smart really smart i mean do, we've done that with some of our brands you know what they don't with. do anymore that i just I, so I, there was a someone did a post and it was about like the 90s things that we wish came back from the 90s or something like that or, and stuff from the 90s it was funny stuff and they're like 90s car security and it was like the club oh, I saw that. <laughs> and then it was uh you know taking off the face off of your yeah your, off your deck. The cd player yeah and all yeah. That stuff. but then there was one in there i didn't realize that they don't put toys like physical toys in cereal boxes anymore yeah hmm. that's not really thing. Probably, they put like codes and stuff in there. or something no they put like codes in there like uh you know uh, scan this and get this thing uh, or whatever yeah. You know, but when we Lame. were kids, yeah, physical is way more exciting. Bro. Margins, I imagine, yeah, sure. Yeah, when yeah, I was a cost kid, to produce it, that's and true, then, and then weight, everything. I'm sure, like, that's, I'm sure that's everything. Did now. you guys? I see now. Now brought back memories. I was like, you know how like the fights I would get in with my siblings because my mom mm-hmm. every once in a while would give in and buy the expensive shitty cereal. And she'd come home and there was a toy in there. Yeah, were you the one that would dig through yes, it dude. first? God, you're like my brother. Your dirty yeah. paws. Slap you. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Gross. Well, no, what I would do is I'd take the bag Find out the of the box so I could see where it was, pull it out. You can never get the bag properly back in the box. always looked like this bulging, <laughs> weird thing. No, yeah. the cereal didn't work anymore. Yeah, <laughs> that was a dead work. giveaway. It's broken. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah if, you're, if your cereal box looks pregnant, you know your fucking brother was in it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Took the toys. <laughs> That's so mad. <laughs> And yeah. the toys were always shitty. So, yeah, I mean, uh, what's your do you do you think this will be? Let's speculate on the success of this will have for McDonald's. Does the, does the stock rise? Does it do really well after after this? Like, we're also heading into, I believe, uh, isn't it coming up on um, Monopoly time? I believe uh, Monopoly time is around the, the that? which that is. So, I I had a client. That there, a big, there was a big controversy around that, right? Conspiracy. Oh, have you never seen the documentary? That's right. Yeah. I did. Oh, That's so okay. good. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, no, it was like a, it was a total hustle for the longest time, like mob guys and stuff. Uh, but what she would do is she, every time, the same time of year, she would buy McDonald's stock and ride it and then sell it after the Monop- the, it, the Monopoly game would always drive so much more traffic wow. to McDonald's that the stock price would always go on a little surge for, you know, I don't, I don't remember the exact period of time. And it was like a thing she did every almost every wow. single year and hmm. had a lot of success doing that. Yeah, that? this year from the 7th of September until October 18th is the Mac- M- Monopoly period. Oh, so oh, it's, it's already going on. So it's going, going on right now. So it's going on right now. Yeah, and but I bet there's everybody's tanking right now. So I, I would, I wonder, I don't think they're done. Well, stock wise, I haven't been opening up my stuff. Is it? Is it I don't look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I don't I don't add. Yeah, yourself. I stopped. I stopped a, a, a while ago, dude. It was getting. So I think was, my portfolio has gone down. Yeah. I don't know, seventy percent or something like that. I really want you guys to watch the Eat the Rich thing, which is all about the whole GameStop. Um, I'm really interested. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's how they manipulated the. Not only that, but it really. I mean, they got into like uh, the retail uh, traders. You know, retail buyers, whatever you would, you call just your average person, and how Robin Hood completely, you know, flipped that model on its head, and how everybody—that's how you. And it, and what's so interesting to me about it is, and when you guys when you guys watch this, this has really only happened over the last couple of years, and so 
part of this crazy stock market run that we've seen in the last few years has been driven by these retail buyers. Yeah. It did not exist in the space, which just makes me think like, wow, how much more volatile is that the because of that, right? It was already, it's already a, a gamble and yeah. risk a little bit. You add in millions of people that aren't, you know, you're, so I don't think it's more volatile. I think the volatility has more to do with the monetary. So why wouldn't you think it's more volatile? I don't think it's it, more volatile. I think it's more that the the big players don't like it because it's harder for them yeah, to predict they what's can't going do on. Those, but I don't think it's more volatile as in terms of like like up and down and going crazy. That's more of just just economic policy. Well, I and don't. You, I mean, it's simple math. If you were if you were to take, uh, let's just say, there was only a million people that were trading before, and now three million people are trading, the swings are going to be. Not higher. It's just math. I don't. So I don't how would know. that not equal more volatility? Unless they're all evenly balanced traders that trade the same way. I, as guess, hedge I guess if you define volatility as is it is it's going to be less predictable based off of past. Not uh, just less predictable, but also bigger, bigger ups swings. And downs. Yeah, bigger ups and downs. Maybe in individual stocks. I don't know if that would work out generally, but that's a good question. Actually, I got to think about that. But yeah, I, that's I, why do, I want you to watch it so we can all okay. kind of because it because it, it does. That's what what came up for me was just like, God, wow. How, how volatile is this thing? Is it way more than we've ever seen before? I mean, I just think I, it's these, the big players don't like it. They don't like it because they can't predict what they could predict before. And they had less now. Cause so if I'm a big mover, I could influence the market by making one or two big moves, mm -hmm. but, and, and, and one or two other investors couldn't touch me unless they also were big movers. But now you've got the ability for them to organize come together like they did with with Reddit, with uh, on the Reddit forums. Yeah. And now it's they're coming against me and but but because they have numbers. So they can't beat me one on one, but now because they have numbers, now they can mess with yeah, and that's what they did. Now. That's what they did in some of these cases. They identified stocks and, and investments that big players were obviously fucking with. Yeah. And they said, "You know what? We see that they shorted well, this stock. Let's blow even, it up." It's not even blow that big up. players were fucking with it. I mean, that this this is a, a basic strategy for a hedge fund is to Look at a company that they uh, have a ninety nine percent chance are going to fail. They know it's on its and way they short out. Short the hell out of it, and they short the hell out of it to you know to to balance out their to yeah. protect themselves. It's just it's smart. It's a it's very and what very they did is they went in and said, "Hey, look at these guys shorten the stock. Yeah, let's, let's get them to lose hell of money by everybody buying it." Which and, I think is hilarious. and they it went so bad. I mean, it was billions and billions of I dollars. Know. I mean, crazy. it completely. You know what's really that. crazy are the are the robo traders. Uh, I mean, they have machines that. Well, that they'll they'll basically program and they'll notice signals and they'll buy and sell so fast that the average trader has no way of competing. There's a lot of controversy around that. Hmm. So I want you, I legal. really want you to watch this so we can have conversation around Robinhood because I was unfamiliar with exactly how Robinhood's uh, model worked until I watched this documentary and am now super fascinated by uh, because they're they're still in bed with a hedge fund, Citadel. So and they really make the their their way they make money is off the consumer. So they have this bias because they basically pair up the well. The more that the, the more someone trades, the more they make. Right? That's right. Okay. That's that's they the get only a commission or whatever. That's the, yeah on the the cents the the pennies on the pennies on the dollar on, for yeah. every transaction. So it's always in their their best interest to try and to get people to to make trades, to sell and buy, sell and buy. Yeah, and then wow. they're and they're and they're getting funding from a a hedge fund, so they have a bias on on how they do things. So. And they actually, you remember when Robinhood shut down uh, GameStop? You couldn't yeah. buy it. Mm -hmm. That was what. So this a lot of controversy around. A that. lot of controversy. So you got to watch it so we can talk. Because about supposedly it they were not influenced, right? Supposedly they were the ones supposed to allow the average tra person to to go in and trade. Yeah. But then they shut it down. They're like, oh, you guys are so. And I under think the they, pressure. Of so the I people. think they won their court case that they did. So I think they 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 didn't. I think I don't know. I don't. I haven't finished the the doc where I'm at. But I don't think they actually got nailed. I think at the end of the day. So what they realized, or what the what the founder realized, was that what was happening with GameStop, even though they were, you know, the little guy was celebrating because they were fucking the man at that time, the inevitable was going to happen because the truth about the company was still true, which is. It was gonna die. Yeah, it was gonna be a block. The next blockbuster. So you could pump the stock up all you want, and at some point, at some point, it's gonna crash. And not only that, the higher we pump it up, the more all these because the people who were gonna buy, who bought, so it went all the way up to like I think six hundred or four hundred some or six hundred peak. And there was all these memes. Like, there was hold, a lot. Hold the line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there, so there was, and so there was a there was millions of people that bought it 
two hundred dollars and three hundred dollars, and it is not a three hundred dollars stock. No, it's not. No matter how you look stock. at it, even if the company has a turnaround, it's not a three hundred dollars stock. And so, the inevitable was happening. So that was the how Robinhood defended himself, or the the founder, I forget his name, defended himself on doing that was to protect their customers. Mm. And so they, you could sell it, but you couldn't buy it. So they restricted you from buying for all that for that that period of time. And of course, again, to your point, they yeah. got in trouble for manipulating and bias. But then after I heard that perspective, I thought, fuck, that's kind of crazy, right? And they they had the wisdom to know that we keep allowing this to, we keep letting people drive this up, knowing that the inevitable is going to happen and it's going to crash. Sure. You know, they're all having a fun time, you know, sticking it to the man, but they're, they're, a lot of them are going to end up hurting themselves. And a lot of them are doing it because they, they're trying to make money off of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then there's people who are like, oh, they're going to hold. No one's going to sell. And then they'll I mean, it's like, them. you guys see what's happened to the NFT market? Notice how it's fucking, uh, I, bro, you know me, dude. I'm not done chatting, <laughs> right? You see, <laughs> the, it Adam's throwing like every uh, meme. Yeah, like, dude, I'm just like, where are all the uh, influencers <laughs> pushing those NFT projects <laughs> right it, now? Didn't it go down? How's your like, invisible house? I think 97% of 97%. The so it was, what, what, and what that means is the, the trade volume. Yeah. The amount of trade volume that was happening on NFT projects just say six months ago or a year ago was like in I, I think it might have been the billions if not it was no like the, no 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 the, more than that no it was it was in the billion can you pull it up Doug for oh me? and so, it's down in the, into the it's like a hundred million it's in hundreds of millions now no it's less than that it's even less than that I don't think I'm not sure if it was trading in the billions and then went down to just the the single digit millions or whatever but I mean it's ninety it was a ninety seven percent drop, drop of what it was it basically yeah. fell off Are you pulling it up right now yeah ninety eight percent drop from what to what oh uh, there's two different numbers ninety seven ninety eight percent I'm trying to find the actual numbers here yeah what right what they're referencing is the trade volume right it was trading yeah. at so many millions or potentially to your point billions of mm -hmm. dollars. And now that's been reduced by like 98%. I mean, Crazy. that's basically- So all my lethargic bonobo wow. NFTs aren't doing too well. <laughs> no, huh? lethargic bonobo. Dang. <laughs> That sucks. I'm so curious to how that's all going to play out after watching that. Did you guys all end up watching that? We did. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we talked uh, about that a bit, like how crazy uh, in depth that whole went with the imagery. What's like, up, Doug? From 17 billion to 466 million. That's it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, You're right. It was in the billions. Yep. Yeah. That's, that is insane. That's, that's great. Speaking wow. of you, companies that crush, uh, so I was at the gym the other morning. I totally forgot you got to tell you guys. And, you know, where I go, it's really nice. I have a nice shower, steam room, whatever. And I pull out my little toiletry bag and, uh, you know, brush my teeth, pull out my Caldera. And the guy next to me is like, oh, pulls his out. It's like, I love that company. I'm like, holy shit. Where did you? I'm like, I'm like, did he listen to Mind Pump? I'm like, where'd you find that? And he goes, oh, my buddy's been telling me about it. Bro, that company's blowing up. Oh, wow. I'm now seeing people like all over the place start to use it and I remember when they were a little bit more obscure when they first started working with us. You know, so, it's, so Caldera, um, Dude, Organifi, beauty. Viore. I'm trying to think however many companies. So there's a handful of companies that we gave them the ability to to use our likeness to for their ads and marketing. Yeah. And so I've had a couple people who Ned uh, and Ned it, did too. Yeah. Oh, Ned yeah. did also. Caldera did, and I think and Viore. I think are the the ones that did. Um, I've had people now reach out of like, oh my God, you guys are famous. This brand, I was just like, we've been partnering with that brand for like four years. <laughs> yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just happen to be pushing us out on a on a commercial <laughs> and they're probably putting tens of thousands of dollars behind it. So it's like getting millions I've, of yeah. eyes on it. So now I've got, I've got a new wave of people in my circle that are like messaging me like oh my god you guys are famous like i've seen saw you on viore i'm like yeah. first of all we were the first company viore ever advertised with and that was like five years ago <laughs> i said that we've been working <laughs> with them because they put some ads out on in, or facebook well or when i was talking so to the famous. dude i'm like where'd you hear about <laughs> yeah. caldera and he's like oh my buddy or whatever he uses it i'm like oh so and then i told him you know about the podcast and how we got sponsored and i said did you use face products before and he goes no yeah i'm like me neither See? i'm like but now i use it all the time he goes i know me too my wife tries to steal it from me i'm like dude my wife too <laughs> so yeah cool. i keep i'm so curious about that like how do they classify this like men's hygiene products because you know how women it's like it's beauty products like that's really how they classify like anything mm. with your skin or anything to like give you some kind of like youthful appearance uh you know but there's a lot more men out there that are like admitting oh yeah i'm like you know i'm rubbing stuff on yeah, there i don't know so. what would they call it yeah beauty you still call it beauty 
No. You're yeah, beautiful. You're cool. yeah. I don't. You know, I just think there's been a a bit of movement in this direction for like the last decade. Radiant of, dudes, and I and I, I really think it started on the you know metrosexual side, right? First, it was like if you were a metrosexual totally. guy, if yeah. you painted your toenails or you did things like that, right? I've been. Ooh, I've, I don't know. That's a little past metro. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but we know why you did it, dude. Right, so right. That's a different thing. But I mean, that's so that's been a, a a thing for over a decade now. And I what I think is happening more than anything else is that guys that would not consider themselves metrosexual are like okay wait a second there's 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 no shame in me taking care of my face like mm. i girls want to look good so do guys, guys want to look good yeah. guys, like, old guys don't like wrinkles just like old girls don't like wrinkles it's mm -hmm. like i can be a masculine guy and still use a product that is going to help that like uh, i think that's you just, call it what you want my literally my wife steals mine and uses it so she likes it and and she's much harder sell than i am because she's used stuff like you know yeah. on her face before no yeah. I'm, I'm super consistent with that are you guys uh do you ever like look at next door that that website we use it all the time okay so do you read like a Gossip. lot of the different things? Like, it, well, yeah. Besides, you get you get a lot of that of like, oh, your dog was in my whoever's dog this is is yeah. shit all over my yeah. yard, and it, you know, and they're, yeah. they're just on there to complain and like all this stuff. But every now and then you'll get like some alarming things, like trends of things in your community or yeah. like in the cities close by and all this stuff. And so, like, Courtney always brings these things up to me, and then I go in there and I read, and it's like, oh, wow, is this, like, a thing? And then you read all these other comments and follow-ups and things. Um, and so I'm, like, I'm like here for PSA, dude. Like, I, I need to, like, put this out there because there's, there's stuff that people should know about. Like, for instance, um, so we just got a, a Target opened up. Um, and you know, we're, we're like stoked. Like we don't have to drive as far. Cause like, you know, this is a cool, uh, with they redid like this, this Kmart. And so now we have like a nice target that's just open. Uh, but, uh, I guess there's been a lot of reports of like young women that oh. go in and are getting followed around by like, you know, two dudes. And then they're, they're finding out that like they have a van outside and it, and what, what they do is they park it like right next. So they, they scope you know, young women and they, and they like park it right next to it. So basically they can open it up and throw them in and kidnap Whoa, them. Hold on. Is it, somebody got kidnapped? Somebody got kidnapped. Oh my God. And like, apparently this is like a trend that Target even knows about and like Walmarts know about, like, this is a thing that like, like a lot of sex traffickers do. Like, well, if, I mean, if you're going to kidnap so women, what is, you go to Target. I, why, so, why, why a Target, Walmart? Why, why is well, that Because Target? you're kind of like, I don't, like, I don't know, you're looking around, like, especially if it's a grand opening well, of like first, a store. Well, like you're, women you're not, love Target. That's a, that's a fact. Well, women yeah, that love too. Target. Yeah. So you're going to go where they go. So that makes sense. Yeah. But that's crazy. Crazy. I was like, in, in right there in, in, in our community, you know, and it's like, it, the, the worst part is like, Target knows this is a thing. It's like every time they have a store, like they have reports and, you know, and it's like, why isn't this like it broadcasted? Like, hey, yeah. you know, and like, because they have security, but it's like, this is when people I'm, just need to be aware of like things like that. When I hear shit like this, I want to go vigilante sometimes. I swear right? To God. I swear to God. You ever watch those videos in other countries where like, there'd be like a guy on a motorcycle try to rip a purse off a woman's hand, uh, arm, and then all, like of a sudden, citizen gets all of a sudden, yeah. the mob gets the guy and beats the shit out of him. Yeah. Oh, that makes my heart warm. I know, I love like, that. I wish that, that, that spinning wheel kick that guy did. Oh. Uh, do you see that video? I have. Where he's oh, running with it. the purse. He just <laughs> yeah. gets blasted. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to see another van pull up and watch with dudes that are like, oh, we're going to watch and see if you try to fuck with someone. Yeah. And I'll, then, I'll start a van that pulls up the van. I don't know if you should, though, Justin. You might uh, go too far. Probably should. <laughs> don't don't go to jail. Crazy, yeah. We need Batman. Hey, check this out. You're not what you eat. You're what you digest. Now, you lose digestive enzymes as you age. So if you don't have enough enzymes, you might only be absorbing 40% of the protein you're eating. That's a super big waste. Well, there's a company called Masszymes. These are enzymes designed to break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates so that you utilize them for recovery, strength, and improve your digestion. That's a big one. If you get bloating, constipation, diarrhea, uh, Masszymes can make a huge difference. Go check this company out. Go to masszymes.com. That's M A S S Z Y. MES.com forward slash mind pump, and then use the code mind pump 10 for 10% off any order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Patrick Runs, Lifts, Eats. Thoughts on drop sets as a finisher? Okay, so first off, he when someone says finish, what they mean is at the end of a workout, and I'm going to take that out of the question and really just talk about the value or non value of a drop set. Because then we can talk about where you'd want to put it, the value of putting it at the end or the beginning of a workout. 
So essentially a drop set is when you do a set with an exercise until it gets real intense and then you drop the weight and then you do more reps. So it's like if I'm doing laterals and I'm using, let's say 20 pound dumbbells and I do 10 reps and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could get another rep and I drop them and then I grab 15 pound dumbbells and then I do maybe four or five more and then I can't anymore. And I put those down and I go 10 pounds and so on. So some people call them run the rack. Other people call them drop sets. They're high intensity uh, builders. They, they're very intense. You get a good pump, easily abused. In other words, if you do these more than every once in a while, I think you'll overtrain. Um, but I do like them as interrupters. I do yeah. like them as ways to kind of novel interrupt. stimulus that yeah. you can use to really just shake things up. I mean, I, 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 I can't imagine like doing those for very long is going to uh, produce that great of uh, result and gains. It's just too uh, intense. They got really popular in the, the bodybuilding community. Um, in fact, this, that's where this term comes from. Yeah. It's like the, the finisher exercise. Um, where I where you can get in trouble, or where I I speak from experience, where where I would, could get into trouble when I was you know training, kind of like this, is uh, if I looked at my total, like let's say chest day. And then uh, the the last exercise I love to do finisher uh, would be like cable flies, and I would do things like this drop set and pump mm. them out like crazy. Uh, and, and then if I were to like evaluate my my programming, it'd be like, oh, I did incline bench press, and then I did uh, you know flat flat dumbbell press, and then I came over and I did, and then I look at the time that I spent on all of it. It's like I was actually spending. Um, you know, almost as, you know, a third of the time of my workout doing this, these finisher type exercises because mm -hmm. the pump feels so amazing. And then I had to ask myself, like, as far as building quality muscle, am, am I better off doing that, you know, 10 minutes of that, you know, finisher exercise, you know, pumping sets on this, you know, cable fly? Or would I have gotten more value from adding one to two more sets of the incline barbell press and the dumbbell press? And so I, I think that where you got to be careful is you start doing a lot of these finisher type exercises in your routine. And you, what it does is you just miss out on some of the bigger bang for your buck type of movements. And the other side is what you said too, is that you tend to overtax. It's like you didn't need to, you know, it's like you already had a good solid six to eight sets already of this chest exercise that it's not necessary. If anything, you are just going to prolong the recovery of that. And you just, you should be hitting that muscle again in two or three days. And now when that's third day, because you had to, you overdid it with this finisher, you now are going to go into that work uh, yeah. less effective. You know what I like the drop sets for when I'm really limited on time? Yes. And I have like, yes. I'm, I can only do one or two sets and then yes. I'll make them real intense sure. and I'll do it that way. I, like, I mean, and I love that because it, they remain novel for me because it doesn't happen that often where I'm like so confined. I only have a 20 minute workout yeah. or something like that. Obviously that's what I'm running right now, but I'm saying in the past, you know, where I, where I would only have 20 minutes and it's like, okay, this makes sense right now. Like I haven't done drop sets or, you know, uh, super sets or even little bits of like mini circuits. Like yeah. I never trained that way. Here's a great time because I'm limited on time. That's how I like yeah. to use stuff like that. I mean, it, to me, it's very similar to like just structuring something like a hundred rep uh, exercise. Like I'm, I'm just trying to get through like maybe two or three exercises to do a hundred reps of. And it's just like, okay, that shakes it up, but uh, that's not something I'm going to apply all the time. Yeah. And I will say that exercises that tend that lend themselves better to drop sets tend to be single joint doing a drop set with a compound lift. Ooh, that really is going to fry your body. And some exercises I would never, I don't want to say never, almost never do a drop set would be like a deadlift. Um, a barbell squat even would be iffy. You could do presses with drop sets, but I like the isolation exercises for drop sets because they're so fatigue based. Yeah. That when your form joints much better. Yeah, and your form starts to break down a little bit. And compound lifts, when your form breaks down a little bit, the risk of injury goes up a lot. Whereas mm -hmm. with the single joint exercise, you know, if I'm swinging a little bit or or my form goes off a little bit, it's not nearly as risky. So I don't necessarily like drop sets for. Compound See, lifts. I agree with that, but the problem and that's what what ends up happening is what I was saying. Like, so I, you end up doing the you know yeah, it's like tricep push down or cable curls. Or you're doing these kind of like. Meh, and it's right. like, and then I, when I the look at maybe a weeks of training, says, it's like, I've had all these. It's like junk volume. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I have all the, I have all these finisher, uh, exercises that I've done in mm -hmm. the week. And it's like, and when I look at them and I know the value of those in comparison to an overhead press, a barbell squat, it's like, man, would I, would I have gained more or would I have got more value in the pursuit of building muscle, burning body fat, sculpting my physique, which is what I was in the business of 
would I have gotten more value from doing a couple more sets of overhead press or deadlift and with that same time? And I think the answer I is I think yes. eight, eight out of ten times, yes. Yeah. Right? There's, so, there's, a, there's a couple times when the drop sets are good and novel, but I agree with you 100%. Right. Which is why I rarely ever program them in clients' workouts. Rarely. And if I did, it was for the novelty effect, maybe to build a little stamina. And or the time thing. Or time, that, right? To me, time thing is it makes the most yep. sense. It's like yep. that's a great it's a great tool. You can get great results from it. Uh, you know, use it when it, it applies. I'll do, I'll do one, I'll probably do a drop set once a month and it's usually with laterals. And it's yeah. usually when I have to do shoulders and I have like 10 minutes. That's it. Okay. You know, so there, there's one more thing that we should add then because this matters too. And we talk about this a lot. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's novel. It's different. It's fun. So if there's this part of like, I want to shake my workout up, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, and yep. do that. But I, the, the reason why it's important that we answer it the way we did at the beginning is just like, I, I, you're not getting more in my opinion, or it's not more valuable than, or, and it could, it could be better to do something potentially else. That doesn't mean that, you know, Hey, it's, it's fun to be creative with the workout <laughs> sometimes and shift your mindset. You know who should look into drop sets? If you've already built a great physique and you've been working out for a long time consistently, yeah. but everybody else, the people who tend to be attracted to drop sets are the ones that are like, I'm trying to get in shape. I'm trying to get I my read body this article. They're the ones that yeah. shouldn't be doing yeah, this. Or I saw this guy. Yep. Yeah. Next question is from N in moose, 1992. What is your opinion of the decline bench? I have never added it to my programming. Am I missing out on something, or is it just a pointless movement if I'm doing flat <laughs> yeah. and incline bench presses? Yeah, I you know, feel this. Yeah, I think I mean all exercise, I guess, have some value depending on how you're applying them. But the decline is an exercise. It's probably one of the least programmed exercises in the workouts I've ever designed. Yeah, I just I think dips. If I'm going to do a movement where I'm pressing in that angle, I like body weight dips. Mm -hmm. Super, I think they're Much superior. Yeah. yeah, a decline bench press. You know why people like? I mean, I'm going to be this is a little controversial because I mean, it's easier. I think people like decline press. That's not they controversial. Put weight that's on the bar. That's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went through a period of my life for almost two years where I did decline bench, and it was the only period of my time or period of my life where I did that. And the sole reason why I liked doing it was because I could put three plates on. Mm -hmm. I couldn't put three plates on at that point at, on a on a regular bench press, yeah. but I could do it on a decline. And so it was just to be able to lift more weight. And when I look back at like the results I got from it, the value that came, just I would dips are way superior. Way you could do a weighted dip, so you could load that plenty fine too. So you could do right. a weighted body weight dip, and the range of motion that you get in that, in comparison to a decline bench, just you'll get it, all it the same benefits it. as the decline bench press and more. And exactly. it's just funky. I've ever like because uh, the gym I used to work out at had your flat bench, had your incline, then had the decline kind of all. And yep. so you just, you thought you had to hit it, you know, one and then the next, then the next. And I, I remember just working out like that forever and, you know, minimal results. And really, I just never really felt like I was getting a whole lot out of the decline at all. Like it yep. just felt like a weird exercise. I'm, I'm like, you know, like getting blood rushing into my head and then started to focus more on depths. And I had a lot more development yeah. as a result. It's one of the worst exercises too, to fail at a lift. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, if you fail at a bench press and it's sitting on your chest, that could be a little scary unless you know how to. Oh my God. You yeah, fail on an incline. Oh yeah, dude. Like I've seen people, I had to run over and help somebody once because it was like rolling up a down towards his neck. I was like, oh shit, dude. Yeah, yeah. If I, if I'm trying to target that, that part of my chest, I'm doing a, a cable fly or I'm doing dips. I just think that, that you get way more value. Plus, I mean, a, a regular bench press with good form is going to hit the lower chest already pretty well. Mm -hmm. So from an aesthetic standpoint, totally. uh, I don't see a huge value. Next question is from lift for carbs. How do you know if you've reached your natural potential for hypertrophy? Don't we yeah. have a calculator for this? Yeah, there are calculators and, and it's based off of like top natural lifters and all that stuff, but there's it, still estimates. Yeah. But I mean, know? it gives you a pretty good idea. It's like, the Somewhat. it's like the argument of the body fat test and all these things. It's like, okay, it's not perfect. So they're talking about muscle size. Is yeah. That what you're talking? Okay. Yeah. For, for building. Okay, so the reason why I picked this question is I think it's a silly question because you're- <laughs> That's why you picked it. Yes, because here's why <laughs> it's silly. I want to tell you it's silly. <laughs> I, well, you know, because this- was, I used ridiculous. to think about this. I used to think about this all the time. Yeah, Like, yeah, what's yeah. the- ma Like, once I understood genetics and I understood, like, oh, I'm never going to look like Arnold, I, I would think, like, what's my natural potential for hypertrophy? Yeah. Okay, so here's the deal. You have a natural potential for maximum muscle growth, but then you also have a potential for optimal muscle growth for health. And if you work out long enough and you know how to put your supplements and your food intake and optimize everything towards muscle growth, at some point, you can get to the point where you build more muscle 
than is optimal for muscle growth. So I know we talk all the time about how building muscle is healthy, yeah. and it is. And for the average person, build as much muscle as you can. But if you're obsessed about it like I am, I got I've gotten to points where I've built Pat, I've gotten to the point where I've hit my natural potential and realized I'm just too big for my body. I mean, I, I'm realizing that right now. Like when my body gets above 200, 205 at, you know, like seven, eight percent body fat. So I'm really very lean. But when I get above 205 at this body fat, it just doesn't feel good. I snore. I don't feel as mobile. My body feels, it just doesn't feel as good. So you have your natural max, but do you really want to get there and stay there? I don't know. Is, uh, is that ours, Doug? That is ours. Yes, we have, we have a, uh, a, a, stero a steroid guy for a muscular potential calculator. Of the <laughs> well, we can blame the marketing Perfect. team for yeah, that. I was going to say it's like the muscular that, potential. That dude doesn't calculator. look natural to me at all. Hey Doug, yeah, can you scroll down? Nothing natural. It allows that, you to but... input your what yes. is it, your height, your your weight, your so uh, okay, and your even, wrist, ankle, an even more fat. generic answer for this person that I can't see is uh, you probably haven't reached it, bro. I mean, the the likelihood, and even if you've reached it, you probably not at it at this moment. Like, I, I just feel like um, I've been doing this for over 20-something years, pretty damn consistent at pretty high levels, and I still see improvement in areas. So there's just... But you've reached that too, though, that point that I said, right? Where you, you, can, you you'll hit that potential and just realize it's just not best for your frame oh yeah no yeah. absolutely i mean we're, we're that's where we're similar in fact i think it was me who was really pointing that out to you earlier on was just that i, I my body does not want to be a certain way and even though i'm ripped you know and quote unquote healthy you can tell it doesn't it's not comfortable yeah. walking around with that much mass and even if it's good mass even if it's all muscle it doesn't matter it's just it it feels unnatural for my my skeletal structure mm -hmm. and my frame is not designed to walk around at 240 it just mm -hmm. is it isn't whether it's 240 and fat or 240 and rip it don't really matter it matters it's a difference right yeah. there's a but it's it's still not ideal what know? were the measurements on there doug that it's asking for on the calculator yeah it's uh height wrist ankle body fat so what you do is you go on this and what's the site you just uh, search map fitness products and muscular potential calculator. So you can go like uh, or mind, mind pump, pump muscular yeah. potential calculator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you enter those in and it's based off of a formula that was based off of some of the top natural bodybuilders and strength athletes. And so it's going to give you this general number. Doesn't mean you'll be able to hit it because this means like you'd be doing everything perfect. Um, and you know, the context of everything is, is ideal. But it does give you, and I think it's relatively accurate. I don't remember what mine was. I, I don't but remember I looked at it mine remember. either, but I do remember when I did it, it didn't seem way off. It seemed exactly. Like, it seemed like, oh, okay. I, I could see that about right. So it seems. Have you ever done one before, Justin? No. Yeah, you don't really care. Don't Justin's care about potential is 320. <laughs> Justin has no idea. Justin's like, I didn't even know we had that. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't care. Yeah. Who is that gorgeous We're, man yeah, up there? Where's our PR uh, calculator? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Next question is from Fit Whitry. What's the best way to deal with social situations where you're more fitness nutrition focused than other people in your circle and they may demonize you for how you go about your way of living? Oh God. Uh, just don't let it affect you. Look, here's the deal. Uh, in a, in a, I'm going to quote someone else right now, but in a world gone wrong, doing, you know, speaking the truth or doing things the right way means you'll necessarily trigger people around you. Mm -hmm. So if you eat healthy and you exercise regularly, the odds are, if you're in a group of people, because the average person doesn't do that, you're going to be the weirdo. So you got to be okay with it. Don't let it bother you. you know, this was I went through this a lot with my family as a kid, and which, by the way, strengthened me to where to the point where, because if you can deal with your, your family, then you go in social circles and I don't care. But I mean, my family, I remember telling my family, no, nah, I'm not going to eat pasta. No, I'm not going to do that. Yes, I need more of this meat. No, I'm going to go work out for two hours. Like my whole family thought I was crazy. My mom thought I was, you're, you know, you're going to go to the hospital. What's going to happen here? But, and I had to just constantly push it and fight it. So you just got to be confident in what you're doing and accept the fact that you're going to hang out. Most people you hang out with aren't going to get it. It's yeah. just the way it is. Do you guys feel like you, or do you know anybody that actually subconsciously seeks this attention though? Like they, uh, oh, they like that they, they stand yeah, out. They pull their six pack bags out on the on the you know the restaurant oh, table yeah. and yeah. you know could I get someone to microwave this and they and, and they they I, I never went that far. Holy yeah, cow. So <laughs> I I think that there's I think there's a, the other side of this too is like some some people are just a little bit of like too prideful, a little self righteous about yeah, it. yeah a little like self righteous about it face. and I think that's also why so 
and why I'm bringing this up to this person is, I, I, for me, I'm always like, I know where you're going. I, I see where you're going. I'm always going to look at myself first and like, yeah. you know, are there things that I can do to make them feel more comfortable, right? Like you, you, you don't have to. You can be a prick about it, whatever. But then I, I'm always trying to think like, you know, it, does it come off that way? Like that I'm like, oh, I'm better than you or look how fit I am because I do these things and you guys don't have the discipline to say no to that. And yeah. so I'm, I'm really careful uh, about that. type. Like, can, can I do this in a discreet way where I don't make them feel uncomfortable? I don't draw any more attention to myself and then I still get to live my life the way I want to live my life and make the food choices I want to make. So f that's first and foremost. Uh, that I would ask myself that. And then the other thing is like, if I'm not competing, which I haven't been for a very long time, these are the times when I actually break bread with them. I mean, I can look, I can sit, I can eat damn near. I mean, we don't, I'm not sitting down at McDonald's with any of my friends. So I could eat at almost any restaurant and find pretty healthy choices on the menu that uh, it's yeah. the difference between them people saying, "Hey, you guys want to go eat pizza?" and then you reply and you go, "No, no, no, thanks." I, I, yeah, it's not good for me. Versus, yeah, versus, I'm not gonna eat that garbage. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't he make everybody right, else right. feel right? Yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it's all about the language, and and I think that's too when you're around family friends that you know are are going through it, and and you're and and I think that's really what what it is is like, uh, oh, that food's not like that's not gonna work for me. You know, that's not good. And like you're just like kind of shitting on all the options around you instead of like just picking the ones that are good and not like really highlighting the fact that like, Oh, you know, woe is me. I can't have this or, you know, I can't cause I'm on such a, a great path right now. Yes. You know, and it, yeah. it's just, it, that's a good point. It's really about how you present yourself. I mean, it, it comes out to me. I, I, you know, I want to say that it, I, I feel like I, that's why I understand some of the people that get all, you know, mean about it and make you feel guilty about it because it's like you made well, them feel bad exactly that's a that's a reflection of how you're but there making, are cases where what they are they're 100 there, 100%, there yeah. is mm -hmm. the other because uh, listen yep. i was that i went through this okay i went for this for years consistently where i had to bring tupperware to every family barbecue and event right. and i remember this process of you know not giving a fuck i'm gonna bring my six pack back i'm gonna do it and then getting to the point where like oh that just draws way too much attention to me i don't like that and I don't want to turn it into like making me feel you feel guilty. And then it turned into what you were saying, Sal, which is I just like, oh no, I'm fine. Th no, thank you. And the only way they would even know I brought my food is if they continue to push and be like, why aren't you eating? I've yeah. seen. I'd be like, I brought my own food. It's no big deal, you know. Like, yeah. and, and downplay it like that versus again, you know, throwing it in their face, making them feel guilty. I had so. one. I had one time. I'll never forget this. And I kind of regret how I reacted. Kind of. Part of me is like, man, he deserved it. But I had a this this one of my cousins married this guy, so he's cousin through marriage, and we were at a family function, and I wasn't eating the pizza, and I wasn't drinking a bunch of beer, and he kept razzing me about it. What's the big deal, bro? You can just have one's not going to mess you up. Come on, have a beer. And it's like all night he kept doing this and pointing it out, even though I was trying not to make a, a big scene about it. And he's like, come on, you, your your abs aren't going to disappear after one time or whatever. And anyway, finally I got mad and I walked over him. I lifted his shirt and slapped him in the belly. And I said, this is why. And he was silent. Now I feel kind of bad about it, but he was on me all night long yeah. about the whole thing. And, yeah. and he, he shut his mouth real yeah, quick. You're going to be that. a dick about it. I mean, that's, that's just kind of how that goes. So slap your friends in the belly. That's yeah. Funny. I mean, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the, like when you have that friend who's like the, 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 they just got saved by Jesus and now they're like their Bible thumper everywhere they go. And they're, oh, they're it's, it's just like, it can become obnoxious. So, Again, if I'm this person asking this question, I'm always thinking about myself and the things I well, can't if, control. If you really want to convert yeah. people to eating healthier, yes, yeah, the same. best way to do just it is model it, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and just be yeah. comfortable with it. Right. Yeah, confident yeah. and comfortable with it. I was like, like, I'm, I'm just doing the, this for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like that's that's it. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have slapped him in the belly. <laughs> Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal, and they cost nothing at all. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out. And less injury. That's another yeah. thing. You'll see less injury as well.